original sin has to do with inheriting both guilt and corruption. So those are distinct things. There's the corruption of the human nature, so that we have a fallen nature, uh, a nature that is anti-God and given to sin, and we inherit guilt. All mankind is condemned twice for blank sin and for our own, what's the phrase from the confession? So it's for Adam's sin and our own actual transgressions. Yes, actual transgressions. So twice cursed. With whom was the covenant of works made? Adam. All right. And with whom is the covenant of grace made? Also Adam. The second Adam. Christ. Um, how were Old Testament believers saved? Through faith in Christ. Yes. Through faith in Christ. So Galatians 3, Adam had the gospel preached to him. Um, David spoke of the resurrection um, and so forth. In, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 2, he says such. Uh, so it was by faith in the Christ who was to come. So it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to put away sin, but without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So all of the, the sacrifices and the typology and the system, the sacrificial system, that whole apparatus of, of, of priesthood and sacrifice was inadequate. It was only a pointer to, to the future sacrifice of the Lamb of God as he sacrifices, offers himself as a sacrifice as our high priest. Uh, so they were saved by faith, by Christ, the Christ who was to come, who was foreshadowed in the, the, the types and promises of the Old Testament, uh, just as we are. All right, uh, fifth, the differences between the Old and New Testaments are matters, not matters of substance, but of administration. administration. Right, administration. They are uh, external and, and uh, relatively superficial. Um, okay, uh, what do we call the system of theology which emphasizes the discontinuity between the covenants? Dispensationalism. Right, that's the dispies. What do we call the system of theology which emphasizes the continuity between the sacraments? True. true. We call it true, yes. Uh, so, reformed or covenant theology. A catechism question, what is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Uh, very good. A couple of uh, just underscoring the, the, you know, the concluding questions from last week. Uh, I think that these are some verses that you, you need you may want to ponder when you're considering the continuity, discontinuity questions. Um, uh, the Apostle Paul is in 1 Corinthians 10 talking about um, the experience of the Old Testament saints and he's drawing parallels between their experience and our experience. Uh, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into the cloud and into the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. <coughs> And then he goes on, and yet some, some fell. Um, verse 4 says, uh, they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, uh, with most of them, God was not pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. And then verse 6, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not despise evil as they did. Now these things, again, and going in verse 11, these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. In other words, there's continuity between their experience and our experience. They, they couldn't serve as examples for us unless their, ex their experience was fundamentally the same. That's his point. They had the same spiritual food. They had drank the same spiritual drink. The rock that, uh, that uh, they experienced... Um, that followed them, as he says, that rock was Christ. 
And so that's an example for us. It's, it, it, if, if, if there was such discontinuity between their experience and our experience, they couldn't serve as examples. We'd say, oh, well, that was the Old Testament. Oh, they were so different from, we, from what we are, then we really have nothing to learn from them because there's, uh, there's, there's so, much, uh, there's so much distinguishing what, what they uh, experienced and, and uh, the gifts that uh, they enjoyed uh, and the, um, the benefits uh, and the means of grace that, that um, characterize that era, that we would just say, oh, well, that's, that, we can just, just, just dismiss that. We, we would never do what they did. We wouldn't ever show weakness like they showed weakness. And he's just undermining that whole argument and saying, look, they ate the same spiritual food we eat. They drank the same spiritual drink we drink. And they, fought, they were following the rock, and the rock was Christ, but they fell. Therefore, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10, let the one who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. If they fail, you can fall. If they can succumb to temptation, you can succumb to temptation. You can't say, well, they had this inferior experience. Not at that point they didn't. He can draw the parallels. All right, and then in, in terms of the discontinuities, I think that the, the text above all that invalidates any attempt to bring Old Testament uh, temple-based type typology into the New Testament is what Jesus said in John 4. Uh, when G Jesus said, um, and neither in, on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. I think it's the most extreme, the most radical thing Jesus says in the whole New Testament. Uh, because up to that moment, up till his entrance into the world, it did matter which mountain you worshiped on. There was uh, Jerusalem's and the temple was normative for uh, the worship of God and uh, the promise of the presence of God and the acceptance of the sacrifices. And there, there, was the, there were the authorized sacrifices and the authorized priesthood and the promise of the glory dwelling in the midst of, uh, and, and, in the, and, and in the, within the Holy of Holies and the temple. There was all of that. And Jesus, in, in these words, is sweeping the whole thing away. Um, Jerusalem was significant because there was the temple. And in the temple were the labors and the altars and the sacrifices and the priests and the priestly garments and all of that. So he is, with a word, sweeping the whole thing away where it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or Samaria or in the temple or in some other building. Um, why? Because he, he, he is going to fulfill all that to which that temple and all of its typology pointed. All of those external factors pointed to him. He fulfills them, and as, 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 he, as he does so, the, the need of them uh, then uh, passes away. Um, so as, as for the normativity of Jerusalem, you know, you worship that, uh, you worship what you do not know. We worship that which we know for salvation is from the, the Jews. You see, th this was the place, but not anymore. From now on, the hour is coming and is now here because Jesus is saying, I am here. True worship will worship the Father, not in Jerusalem in the temple, but in spirit, which is, has to do with the motivation, and in truth, which has to do with the proper way of approach. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So this is, um, here you see the continuity. Here you see the radical discontinuity. So the whole idea that you would have New Testament priests offering sacrifices on altars in temples is contrary to what Jesus is teaching here directly in John chapter 4. We don't have a temple. We don't have a priesthood. We don't have sacrifices. We don't have labors. Uh, we don't have a priesthood. Okay. Terry, so, in, in dispensationalism, is, is it accurate to say that um, the each new covenant, of which I mean they have several, I think some set, typically set, six or seven or eight dispensations. Can, can you say that each new covenant in dispensationalism? comes about because of a failure or a weakness of the previous covenant? Is that, is that accurate to say that? Or um, I, I think it is accurate. Um, I, th I think that it, it, uh, in, in, with each, each new dispensation, there are new principles at work. So that 
there, there, if, if, it was, if it wasn't failure, failure was inadequacies, so that there is a building. But um, I mean, the major dispensation, dispensational differences, Old Testament and New Testament, that's law. Ours is grace. Uh, that's works. Um, ours is faith. Um, that's the Old Testament people of God. This is the New Testament people of God. Radical discontinuities between those uh, two eras when you look at classical dispensationalism. By the way, there's a new, there's a new book out called The Fall of Dispensationalism, and um, it's a, I heard an interview with the author the other day. It's very interesting because dispensationalism dominated evangelical Christianity in my, in my childhood and youth. Absolutely dominant. How Lindsay's late great planet Earth took the whole world by storm. And but, you know the whole Left Behind series that was very popular in the 80s and 90s. It's, a, it's as though the whole thing has collapsed. And I, I'm glad to see it collapse in one respect. Um, be, be, but I, I think that theologically it was just um, implausible. It, it was just it failed at point after point, biblically speaking. What so will what will replace it? Yeah, who knows. Um, hopefully, reformed theology, covenant yeah. theology. The, the alternative to bad is not necessarily good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might be unbelief. Yeah, yeah. Why did it fall, or why has it fallen? I'm saying I think it fell because ultimately, as biblically, wasn't plausible. It wasn't accurate. There were too many arguments against it. It failed to see the continuities. It saw discontinuities where there weren't discontinuities, and 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 so. Um, it, 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 uh, it couldn't stand the weight of exegetical interpretive weight. So, so to, you know, to, to, to say that there's no normativity of the law in the New Testament, for example, and to say the Old Testament saints were saved by, by law keeping, it's just, um, it, it, it doesn't add up. Terry, do you know that author? Uh, not offhand. Okay. The, the other thing, because I've uh, seen one by David Hummel, The Rise and Fall. That's it. The, um, the rampant predictions of Christ's imminent return in like the 70s and 80s all failed. None of them came true, and it just so so. Right. So for you younger guys out there, I still think of myself as very young. Uh, um, when is- Israel became a nation in 1948, the eschatologic, the eschatological, es- eschatolog- excuse me, the eschatological fervor reached a pitch, and they interpreted Matthew 14 when Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away. Uh, they interpreted the, form, uh, f- the forming of a Jewish um, you know, republic in, I- in Israel as the fulfillment of that prophecy of the last generation. And so they said 40 years from 1948. Um, or if a generation is 25 years, so 48, 58, 68, 73. So, you know, there were all these predictions about Jesus returning in 1973. This is when I'm at college, 73, 74, right in there. I attended the, the Light and Powerhouse, which was Hal Lindsey's school on the UCLA campus. The Kappa Sig House had been taken over by Lindsey, and he had a, fa- a small faculty. And I, I lived there for a summer and took classes. The good thing that came out of that um, was that I, I, uh, one of the classes uh, featured Francis Schaeffer very prominently, and that got me into reading Francis Schaeffer, who was reformed in his theology, and that was absolutely life-transforming for me as a student. But at the same time, I was taking these classes from Lindsay, and it was just, you know, they were just head scratchers. So just, you know, even me with a mind full of mush as a, you know, soon to be a junior in college, it just, you know, it just did not add up to me. And and I think that ultimately this, this was the problem, dispensationalism, is it just couldn't stand the weight of the scriptural evidence for the discontinuities and continuities in the New Testament. As for Jesus, you know, fulfilling, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, the sin of the world. He is the temple. He is our great high priest. Um, he is our Passover, connection with the uh, religious holidays and um, here, here's uh, the uh, circumcision as functioning as baptism uh, does um, in terms of the again this the uh, differences of, of administration are, are external uh, sign and seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised yet he applies it to his son 
So when we get to baptism, we'll, we'll look at that. It's a sign and seal of the righteousness he had by faith, but he's commanded to apply it to his eight-day-old son. How does that make any sense? Unless there's some um, solidarity of the family within the covenant that, uh, that um, makes way for permission to do that and, the, and, the right, and for that to be right and proper. Um, uh, so, uh, Colossians 2, we see the same circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the circumcision, circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism. Baptism um, being the equivalent of circumcision. So there, there's, the, there's the difference in the external functioning the same. And, and here is the sp spirituality of circumcision in terms of its uh, primary meaning, and yet it's being applied to infants. All right, so leaving that uh, behind, let's press on question number 14. Identify the threefold office of Christ, our Redeemer. How does he fulfill each? So what are the three offices? Prophet, priest, and king. All right, and how does he fulfill each? So the prophet, he declares the will of God. And as the priest, he mediates and is the sacrifice that's necessary. And then as king, he reigns over all things. Right, right. And so that is typically, um, the threefold office is typically uh, attributed to Calvin, but as it turns out, there's actually deeper roots. If you read your notes, um, there, there's uh, evidence of this among the church fathers, amongst the medieval theologians, and then um, amongst uh, the earlier reformers. But Calvin seems to have been the one who put the three together in a kind of emphatic way, memorable way, and so it's often attributed to him. But it is a very handy way to look at what Christ came to do. Is he a prophet? Well, yeah, I mean... What about the parables? What about the Sermon on the Mount? What about the Sermon on the Plain? I mean, the, you know, the New Testament, the Gospels are just full of Jesus' teaching. So he's, 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 a, he's the greater than Moses and um, the greatest of all the prophets. Is he, is he a priest? Well, he's our high priest, isn't he? He intercedes for us. He offers up himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice. So both in terms of, of uh, sacrifice, um, the priest that offers the sacrifice, he himself is the sacrifice, and he is a priest in his intercessions for us. Romans 8, interceding on our behalf. Uh, king, does he reign? Well, he's, uh, he's uh, raised and ascended and seated. He's seated at the right hand of power on high. He will return, establish his eternal kingdom. Uh, yes, he rules and reigns right now. Jesus, you know, 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 15 was about verse 26. He will reign until all his enemies are under his feet. Not he will begin to reign, but he is now. He will reign until he's now reigning, and he will one day complete that reign. That reign will be consummated, and all of his enemies will be under his feet. So he is reigning. He is king. And uh, that, that rule, that uh, subduing of his enemies and, and ruling over all will one day come to completion. So here's what the, the confession says. From, it that, from that point on, will we think of it as like God is reigning rather than Christ is reigning? Or? Well, he say, says, uh, it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, 27, he will then deliver up the kingdom to the Father. So the triune God together reigning over the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of Christ, which is a spiritual kingdom. Okay. Uh, it pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the, lo the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son. Um, so there's um, another statement of his identity, his only begotten son, to be mediator, the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, uh, so, amongst the theologians, they speak of their officium triplex, the threefold office, prophet, priest, and king, the head and savior of the church, the heir of all things, the judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed and to be by him in time redeemed, 
called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. Comma. The one Christ and only mediator between God and man. All right, question... Fifteen, describe Jesus Christ's true divinity, describe his true manhood, and cite scriptural support. So the paragraph three and goes on to say, the Lord Jesus in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, having in him the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, scriptural language throughout in whom it pleased the Father that all the fullness should dwell. Uh, that is a citation of Colossians 1.19. To the end that he, that he being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth. That's uh, Hebrews 7.26 and John 1.14. He might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of a mediator and surety which office he took not unto himself, but was there unto called by his Father, who put all power and judgment into his hand, and gave him commandment to execute the same. All right, so in terms of the true divinity and true manhood, where would you go to establish his true divinity? Yes, the capacity, uh, Colossians 1.19, Colossians 2.3. Yeah, in, in, your, in your, your copies of the Confession, you have, you know, the Scripture proofs that you can consult. But here, here are the type of texts that are cited. In the beginning was the Word, and the, in the beginning. So Gregory of Nyssa, one of the church fathers, said, there was never a time when he was not. Against the Arians. Yeah. Was there a time when he was not? No. There was never a time. Where he was there when? In the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He was God and he was with God. All things are made through him. He's the creator. And without him, not anything made that was made. And then connecting that to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Um, as for the dual nature, uh, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law. There's the human and the divine. God sent forth who? Sent forth his son. But she was born of a woman, a divine nature and a human nature. Um, Colossians 2.9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, human and the divine. The fullness of deity, but bodily. There's the union of uh, divine nature and the human nature. Uh, Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Um, you know, an another line of argument that we looked at when we were looking at the doctrine of the Trinity, who is it that made all things and providentially um, upholds all things, upholds the universe, if it isn't God? <laughs> I mean, these are, these, are like, these, are, these are God's jobs, right? He makes everything and he governs and upholds all things. And if that's attributed to the Son, the Son must be God, because that's God's work. If there is anything that's God's work, it's creating all things and governing all things. And yet that's being attributed to Christ the Son. Uh, Philippians 2, uh, 5 through 8, um, I, in addition to your notes, I've added a discussion from B.B. Warfield in his uh, 
very, very learned sermon called Imitating the Incarnation, an exposition of this passage, uh, Philippians 2, uh, 5 through 8, um, where the Apostle Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, that's the word morphe. So in, in Warfield's discussion, he points out that in Greek thought, everything was divided into, uh, um, into form and matter. You have, you have the um, sort of the distinctive that makes the thing what it is, and then you have the stuff out of, what, out of which it's made. So in that, in that discussion, if you take a sword, for example, um, it is steel that makes a sword a sword, and, it, and it, so that would be its matter, and it shares steel with, you know, with uh, hammers and axes. And, but the thing that makes the sword the sword and differentiates it from other tools made out of steel is its morphe. So it's the swordishness of the sword is, is, is what would be identified with morphe. So, so uh, Warfield argues with the Apostle Paul using this word, he is saying that, that, that he was in the, in the form of God means that the thing, those distinctive qualities that make God, God are his. The distinctive things that make God deity that separate, say, God is spirit, separate God from all other spiritual beings and all other beings, that is what characterized the Son of God in eternity. He was in the morphe of God. Yes? Did the Old Testament Jews know, or should they have known, that the Messiah was going to be God, or did they only find out when Jesus told them that he was God? Psalm 110. They should have known from Psalm 110, right? Daniel 7. I think they could have pieced things together, but I think, I think the fullness of the doctrine of the Trinity is a New Testament revelation. Because I mean, I know Jewish people have answers for all the Old Testament passages. Yeah, Psalm 110, the Lord has said to my Lord. Jesus cites that. What, who, who's, who is the Lord's Lord? Um, he, he cites that as prophetic of himself. So, I mean, I, yeah, yes, I mean, the Psalm, uh, Psalm, 6, uh, Psalm 16, you know, the. Psalm 16, Psalm 2 are cited in Pente at Pentecost in uh, the Christian sermons. Psalm 110 is cited. All these are, are cited as prophetic of what Christ would do and his identity. Um, Psalm 2, he's the son of God. He's the son. Today I have begotten thee. It's cited at Jesus' baptism uh, as well as at the transfiguration. So, I, you know, I, I think how many of them understood the fullness of the you know, of the, uh, the dual nature of Christ. I don't think that many of them put all that together with that kind of accuracy. I think they had kind of a, a dim awareness that uh, we, we shall call his name Emmanuel, you know, from Isaiah, God with us. The virgin shall be with child. So there's, you know, the hints are there. Whether or not they could put it all together, um, we don't know. I think yeah, so when they when they were when the disciples who most were um, good Jews when they were when they were looking for the Messiah to come what what were they look what were they looking for were they looking for just a man or well, and and it would be a very hard sell to any Jew that a man could be God yeah because if if anything is fundamental, it's the distinction between God and his creation. So. So, yeah, so ex exactly how God was going to rescue them, through, through what agency, I don't think that that was all that, I don't think it was all that clear. I think, um, I, you know, when I was preaching through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you know, I think that that lays out that there's this hope that the Davidic king is going to be the savior you know exactly what would be his full, the fullness of his nature. I don't think they understood that, but they understood that through David there would be a savior that would come. And um, you know, there's the there's the disappointment. It's one after another is a failure, and isn't that uh, deliverer? Isn't that savior? 
uh, until finally. Then Matthew, you know, Matthew 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David. But they also like the disciples of John the Baptist were asking Jesus for John if he was the one. And Jesus, Jesus' response was, go tell John what you've seen. The, 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 the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. So they know he's some, some, whoever was supposed to come was going to be somebody very special. Right, those are, those are citations from Isaiah. Is it Isaiah 26? I forget exactly. But anyway, they, uh, those are drawn right out of Isaiah's prophecy. So yeah, the evidence was there. Uh, how many of them put the whole thing together? I think there was a, among the faithful, there was a general trust that God would save his people and that he would provide salvation, not just, uh, not just political salvation, but um, spiritual salvation, salvation of souls, a savior for them and establish his kingdom. Okay, but back to Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Um, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. He was truly a form, in other words. He was the, uh, the, his, um, the, the uh, 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 that, that which makes a servant a servant was characteristic of him. And he humbled himself by being, or rather, uh, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness. Um, and Warfield argues that the word likeness there is, is indicates, is used because of the, the intention to indicate that he was truly man, but not only a man. Um, but so a man truly, but more than a man. And that same for, uh, form of that word is found, we'll just look at this at Hebrews 2.17 in a minute. After being found in human form, again there, truly human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Hebrews 2.17, he had to be made like. So this likeness and like his brothers in every respect. So again, the human and the divine being united in uh, the person of Christ. Uh, Romans 9.5, well, I was in class with, uh, with J.I. Packer, we'll do a little name dropping here, uh, my first year in England, and he was teaching bas you know, the basic theology class, the prolegomena and the doctrine of scripture and then doctrine of God, and he said, uh, well, it, it, uh, there is a passage in which Jesus is called God. And, and then he said, and you're saying to yourself, I should like to know where that passage is. <laughs> that would be most useful to know. And so he then turned to Romans 9, 5, to them belong the patriarchs, that is to the Jews, and from their race according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. So you can fiddle with the punctuation and try to invalidate that. Uh, he was quite insistent, and I think most of the modern grammarians are, that that's exactly what, Paul, is what the apostle is saying. That Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. When Thomas is confronted by Jesus, he says, my Lord and my God, also. Yes. That would be another passage that you could, to which you could point. Yes. Uh, Isaiah 9. Yes, Isaiah 9. Um, so it might be helpful to just go over, this is in your notes, but to just go over this uh, sh uh, shortly. Among the ancient heresies that the confession and the ancient creeds refute, and by, by the way, the language of the confession is drawn straight out of the Nicene Creed and Chalcedon. Uh, truly God, truly man, that's Nicaea. Um, uh, union without confusion, which is the formula, I think is the easiest to remember. Uh, when you it, to, to rightly understand the, 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 the nature, the dual nature of Christ, is that you have the union of the human and the divine without the confusion of the union and the divine. Um, so where it says, for example, part without composition, without confusion, that's right out of uh, a Chalcedon. Don't confuse, don't try to mingle and, uh, he's not p part human, part divine. He's truly human, truly divine. They're not mixed. They're not confused. They each partake of their own properties. So don't attribute to the human what's true of the divine, and don't true, uh, attribute to the divine what's true of the human. So they are, this is really finessed. So another thing Dr. Packer says, my revered theology teacher, 
um, is, is that the most difficult intellectual task the human race has ever had is, was formulated in the doctrine of the Trinity and of the dual nature of Christ. And it took four, four, 420 years to get it right. So from 30 AD to 451, Council of Chalcedon took, four, took uh, you know, 420 years to, to, to iron out exactly what was meant by uh, the divi well, how were we to understand the divinity of Christ and his humanity. So among the heresies, Arianism, Christ is divine but created. There was a time when he was not. Okay, that's refuted. Classic theism refutes that. The, the confession affirms classical theism at that point. Apollinarianism, Packer calls it the envelope theory or where the outer shell of Christ is human while the inner person is divine. There's no true union of the two natures in the one person. So you just have a shell of humanity, but he's really divine. There, so, so the human qualities are missing, except for a physical shell. Um, Sabellianism, the one God is revealed in three successive manifestations. What Sinclair Ferguson is likened to playing three characters in a single movie. And That's what, modalism. Huh? That's modalism, Patrick. Um, mm -hmm. Modalism. Um, sometimes uh, the ice, water, um, steam is another kind of modalism. Uh, recently referenced the Shamrock in that sermon. Uh, St. Patrick. Yeah. Tim, uh, Shaw. Tim Shaw said that on Sunday yeah. night. Again, that's probably describing it as a poor analogy. <laughs> yes. A lot of well-intentioned people have tried these analogies. Just Saint normal Patrick Christians guy, try to describe so it to people as ice analogy. and water. You don't understand <laughs> that they're heretics as they do so. I've seen it trying to explain with coins, you know, like a quarter, a nickel, and a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's all. It, it, There's no analogy. that begins right? with the Trinity is like is going to be heresy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, it, it isn't like anything else. I think that's a good point. What is it like? No, there isn't anything like it. And so all the metaphors and all the analogies are, are going to fail. So uh, is it... Uh, I don't know if it's Ferguson or Packer, I don't remember anymore, uh, talks about, um, what's the name of that actor? Uh, Peter, Sellers. Peter Sellers, yeah. Plays three different uh, characters in uh, a single movie. Um, that's uh, what he likens to Sibelianism. So you really just have one person. And, and they're just play acting the other part. So you have, you have, uh, you have the, um, you lose, you lose, as I say here, you lose the distinctive personhood of the son. You, ha you end up with one person. You, you end up eliminating the three persons, and they're all merged into a single person. Yes? Uh, so what was the Muslim supposed to jump on that is ridiculous for God to pray to himself? And like, how do we assert that it's a perfect, like, reasonable? Because there's a distinction of persons. So in the unity of the Godhead, there's a distinction of persons. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Spirit is not the Son or the Father. They are distinct persons and yet one God. And that's similar to why um, how would you say like he's not glorifying himself as God glorifying him? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying like, the right the way yes. There, yes, the distinction of persons. There is, um, you're, there's, there's the union, but without the confusion in terms of the nature of Christ, but there is also distinction of, of persons. Three persons in the Godhead, they are of the same substance, they are equal in power and glory, but they are distinct persons. And they can't be merged into one person. They have fellowship within the Trinity. They do. So, so they're not <laughs> dependent on us in any way. Right, John 17 speaks of the, you know, the fellowship of the Father and the Son that they had from all eternity, eternally delighting in each other, eternally uh, enjoying each other, and, not, uh, and so without need. Um, uh, Nestorianism, what Packer calls the pantomime horse theory, two persons with two natures dwelling in a single shell rather than one person with both human and divine uh, nature. So, so what the heresies tend to do, what the her what the heresies tend to do is they tend to either um, they, they, they will tend either to confuse the natures or to separate the natures. And so, so separating them and not understanding the proper union or 
uh, or, the, or the opposite. In other words, you have to have union but not confusion. Um, you have to have distinction, that, uh, an understanding of distinction that nevertheless is compatible with union. There's also saying? Eutychianism, which is the one that combines the two, so that the lost are to one new nature. Yeah, I, I need to add that one to my notes. Yeah, go, what, t describe that again, would you? Eutychianism, so the nature, God nature, man nature is combined into one new nature, so that both are lost and just completely confused. E U E U E U E U E U Y. Yeah, Eutychianism. You, you all got that. E U T Y C H I. That's what I was thinking. All right. <laughs> Question, yeah. Um, what, what would be, are there modern successful manifestations of these heresies, or are they? Uh, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormonism, uh, Hint, um, Islam, um, all, all of them fail to understand the divinity of Christ. And then there's a lot of. Um, Jesus only Yes, Jesus only Pentecostalism. Is, is that one that's Pentecostalism? Yeah, one. Iglesia de Cristo in the Philippines um, are in the same thing. Yeah. And I think in popular Christianity, I think that the error goes both ways. I think there are people who have such a human understanding of Jesus that they lose his divinity. And then I think there's others that so emphasize his divinity, they lose his humanity. And so they fail to, um, you know, to really appreciate it and enjoy the fact that he, share, that he shares our nature. And that, that, uh, that's a meaningful thing for us when we are in, in, in need. And we're formed, we're very intentional about using the word truly, qualifying it and not quantifying it. I'm not saying 100% God, 100%. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I'm very uncomfortable with the, uh, it, it's popularly said he's 100%, 100%. I think mathematics don't belong in this, uh, in this. Truly. truly. Truly God, truly man. A true humanity, true divinity, united in a single person, but not confused. Um, so, so I've skipped over the, um, where is the language, where, where's the word composition? Yeah, here it is, in paragraph two. Did I, I, I think I failed to read paragraph two somehow. So let, let's, just, let's just go over it and see the way the confession teaches this. The Son of God the second person of the Trinity being very an eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father. So you have the Son of God and God the Father dwelling in eternity. You're getting a reaffirmation of what we saw in chapter 2, uh, God and the Holy Trinity, uh, of one substance and equal with the Father, did when the fullness of time was come, that's Galatians 4, 4, take upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof yet without sin i.e. truly man what's true of us what's true of him minus sin so all of the aches and pains and ailments and and all the, the, the fullness of human experience he entered into he walked our streets okay um, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary, of her substance, so there's, again, there's human nature, so that two whole perfect and distinct natures, two natures but distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were, uh, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, That without the one converting the uh, converting the other in, into itself. So that contradicts you taking this. Our no, notes has conversation, conversation instead of conversion. Well then, Our notes do. who gave you that defective? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, we pulled this we pulled this off the internet so we didn't have to retype. Yeah, right? yeah. I have never known anything to be unreliable that's on the internet. This is shocking to me. 
I need all typos to get turned into me. But if it, say, yeah. it says here com without conversation, composition or confusion, so they didn't talk with each other <laughs> about it? Yeah. yeah, they didn't have any conversation well, to turn well, Is it a long word or should it be conversion? This, this says conversion. Well, it's it's a little brown book. There's a lot of typos on it. Oh, so and, and, and your text. Yeah. But the, the other thing, in the 17th century, conversation didn't necessarily mean us talking to each other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's the wrong word. Okay, so, so without, without conversion, so the, the, one, the one nature does not overpower and transform um, the other nature into itself. The, the, the divinity does not swallow up his humanity. His humanity does not swallow up and transform and, and, and nullify, in effect, his, his, his um, divinity. Composition. So he's not got these, these parts that are divine and these parts that are human. He's not composed of various parts divine and parts human. Or confusion. So again, they maintain their distinctive properties. That is the point. Um, without confusing those. So we ought not to attribute to the divine what's true of the human or what's true of the human to. So, so when, 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 when Jesus was thirsty at the well, God was not thirsty. Does that make sense? Does that make the point? He was not, the divine nature was not thirsty. He, the man, the human nature. In his human nature, he was hungry. The person, Jesus Christ, who was human and divine, was thirsty. But the divine nature, God was not thirsty. I think it's right also to say that at the cross, God did not die. God entered into the death of man. Divinity was not extinguished. Divinity did not uh, cease to exist. Divinity could not cease to exist. So we'll, we'll get to that when the description of the of, of the of, of the uh, you know of the work of Christ so so Christ died the death of man he didn't die the death of God and the, the but the divine nature added the weight and value to that death and sustained his humanity under the weight of God's wrath yes so when Jesus was in the garden and he was like if there be any way let this come from me or he's on the cross and he said my God my God that affecting both natures, or was it only affecting one of his natures? I think the pain and suffering is, is the person, in the person, the suffering was taking place. The person is human and divine, but he experiences it through his human nature. And, and by virtue of the union, the divine nature participates in it, but doesn't suffer. A few yeah. months ago, you spoke on the podcast about the, the gentle and holy book. And if I remember what you said there, you critiqued it because on the emotional analysis of that book, it was missing the distinction of Christ's emotions being from his human nature. Is that, is that, yes. is that accurate? Well, my, I haven't read it carefully enough, except that I did check those portions. And I went back, and I would happen to be reading Thomas Goodwin at the same time that that book is based on. And Goodwin is very careful to distinguish between what's properly attributed to the human nature of Christ versus the divine nature. So, so Goodwin's a very careful theologian, and Dane Ortland was a less careful theologian. The impassibility of God yes. is in the divine nature of yes. Christ and isn't a place where he feels the things that were discussed in that book. Is that right? As I understand what you said, yes. Okay, let me keep, continue to re read uh, without c conversion, composi uh, composition, or confusion. Which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Uh, the Lord Jesus in his human nature, thus, thus united to the, the, to the divine, uh, was sanctified and annoyed with the Holy Spirit. We read this already, but let's just look at it again. Above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all the fullness of deity should dwell, to the end that being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished 
to execute the office of a mediator and surety, which office he took not unto himself, for therein called by the Father, who put all power and judgment into his hand and gave him commandment to execute the same. Okay. Um, so is, is God, is Jesus in heaven with his physical body at the right hand? Of yes. The okay. So yes. There's a body right there. Okay. Yes, I, yes, and I, I think that that is, is um, very, a rich subject of, of, of meditation, that at the right hand of God is a man who is pleading on our behalf, who understands. I mean, that's the point of Hebrews 2, 17, and Hebrews 4, you know, 15, 16. Um, he's, a, he's, he's, you know, that, that's, that's... Which is another reason that transubstantiation has to be false. Or even the Lutherans have to be false. Right, because he's true, it, it, he, he is s still truly human and truly divine at the right hand of the Father. So the way that the writer to the Hebrews applies this is he, he says, uh, we're going to look at this in a minute anyway, but let's just go ahead and look at it now. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Get, get the point. Made like his brothers in every respect to make propitiation for the sins of the people for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. So there's the practical difference that is made when we understand the full humanity as well as the full divinity of Christ. He's able to help, and, and he's inclined to help. He, he, he understands exactly what it is to be human. Um, so again, Hebrews 4, uh, we do not have a high priest, verse 15, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. So he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near. Why with confidence? Well, because he understands our weaknesses. He sympathizes with those weaknesses. He has been subject to those weaknesses, those temptations, yet without sin. So we can draw uh, near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this, this is one of, the, one of those points to me at, at which you see the practical difference a proper theological understanding makes in terms of living the Christian life. I mean, that, that, that directly impacts your prayers to know that. Yes? The, so the Christ is at the right hand of the Father physically, but could we also accurately say the Spirit of Christ is with us still, or is that the Holy Spirit? But, but what I'm thinking of is, though I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, so is he saying, me by the Holy Spirit? Yeah, he by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is his representative. Well, that's why it's called the Spirit of Christ, because he is Christ's agent, his comforter. I will, I will send to you another comforter. Yeah, um, the Roman Catholics missed this incredibly with their <coughs> need for um, approaching God through Mary. She's more uh, understanding. And, and Bettner says they completely miss um, the approachability of Jesus in the Gospels, even even as he walked the earth, how approachable he was by everyone. And they, you know, just to not see that, it's, it's a huge blind, uh, blind spot. So and they pray to Mary, save us from your son. I think, I, I, I think that the, vul the vulnerability of the church to um, an alternative intercessor has to do with an overblown understanding of the divinity. It's where the divinity of Christ has swallowed up the, his humanity. So the medieval Jesus, you can even tell by the, the medieval art, such as it was, he's aloof, he's distant, he's remote. And, and, but, but Mary, I mean, look, at, look at her in John 2 with the, the water into wine. They go to Mary because Mary's approachable. So we go to Mary and they say, tell Jesus to do something about, you know, we've run out of wine. Can he, can he do something about that? So they take that as a model because Jesus is scary. Jesus is, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, again, it's an overblown, it's a, it's a disproportionate understanding of the, the union of the human and the divine. Thomas? Can we just, can we say that we have Jesus because we have the word? Like the word is God. Like we have the word in our hearts. Like we have Jesus in our hearts in that way. 
Come again? Well, but Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in your heart. He didn't say let, let he, he doesn't make a distinction there between word and Christ. I mean, he does make a distinction. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So he's, he's not saying one supersedes the other. Well, because John, the word became right. flesh. I think, I think word should be understood as a title. That's one of his titles, is that he is the word, the logos uh, from all eternity, that word, that divine word that spoke creation into existence. And um, so I don't, I, um, as long as you understand word as Christ and Christ as word, but I wouldn't identify scripture as Christ. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I would, I, scripture is not Christ. Um, and the, the concept of word, in, as in John 1, is much bigger than just the Bible. Yeah, it's the Son of God. It's, it's, it's uh, the, the second person of, of, of the Trinity. Yeah, yes, Matthew? Oh, no, I'm just saying it's more than just speaking. That Matthew. Oh, I can't sit behind you. I'll just talk about, uh, no, that would be insulting. No, no, don't, no. Old Matthew and young Matthew? I was going to say... It would have been, that would have been mean to say bald Matthew and <laughs> young Matthew. Um, so kind of back to Aaron's question, though. You know, we're talking about the dual nature of Christ. Can we say, I mean, obviously, Christ and his divinity is still omnipresent. It's not that the Holy Spirit is not And then you get the three in one, and you talk about the Trinity and all this other stuff. So truly man, he is in one place. Not, he's not, he doesn't have ubiquity. He's not ubiquitous. But Christ and his divinity is still omnipresent. You know what? I'll up, I'll up, one up you on that. <laughs> In that, with Dr. Old studying the sacramental theology of the Reformers, in the end, I concluded, I have no more authority for this than I concluded, <laughs> that the difference between Zwingli and Calvin is that Zwingli believed that in the Lord's Supper, Christ in the fullness of his divinity is present. Calvin believes Christ in the fullness of his divinity and humanity is present spiritually. The spirit of Christ is truly God and truly man as well as is Christ incarnate and that at the Lord's Supper you get the whole Christ you don't get just his divinity you get his humanity spiritually which has to be because they are inseparably joined mm -hmm. they are inseparably joined yeah. so to, to wrap all of that up you would have to say there are many many things that we must affirm without being able to logically reconcile them all to each other mm -hmm. we still have to affirm Yes, and uh, did I draw the little circle with the dot inside of it? I, um, Are you going to give us a Trinity analogy? This, 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 <laughs> this is another Packerism. Uh, if, if, if the, the, um, this circle represents uh, the truth. Uh, truth itself is right here. We know that everything out here is error. And inside here is truth, but we can't exactly pinpoint it. So we know all this stuff out here, it's all wrong. Um, and we know the truth lies in here, but we can't get very precise about it. So we get as close as we can, and we, and we shouldn't expect to get too precise because we're dealing with the infinite and we're finite. We just, we just can't know. But we can only take these things so far. Yeah, excuse me? If we understood it, we would be honest. Yes. All right. And let's didn't Jesus say, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven? They don't understand all these intricacies. They just believe with all their heart that what is true is true about God. Ju just so you don't make that an, an, an excuse for, for being simplistic. Right. All right. And settling for a child's understanding when, in fact, God has, ha has much to say about himself that he means for us to understand. So that we can glorify him more fully because yes. we understand the perfection and the intricacies and the 
incomprehensibility of God? Yes. Okay. Yes. Even if we only can draw the circle and... and Okay. In fact, as we grow in that understanding, I think relative to all that could be known, we're probably still closer to the child yeah. than we are. To right. That's why Calvin says God listens yeah. at us. Yeah. Yeah. He just babbles and te- speaks baby talk. Most of the rest of eternity, you still never fully get to know. Right. Right. So, so you've, you've opened the door, Matthew, for me to use Big Sur as an analogy, which I love to do. <laughs> When you drive down Big Sur and you turn a corner and you get out of your car and you look, it's absolutely, it's the most beautiful thing in the whole world. Absolutely breathtaking, the cliffs and the water and all that. And you go around the next corner, it's a whole different vista. And it's absolutely breathtaking. You go around the next, the same thing. I wanted to pull over every couple of hundred yards. And you go on and I think that's, that's what I think eternity is going to be like. You will never exhaust the beauty and the glory and the wonder of God, it will go, because he's infinite, this, this gasping grasp of beauty just will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. It'll never be exhausted. It'll never be anything less than thrilling and moving and exciting and breathtaking and wonderful. All right, let's take a five-minute break.